All right, uh, good evening, folks, and welcome to another edition of the Sydney Saxophone Network Q&A Sessions. I'm your host, Nathan. I hope wherever you are in the world, you are keeping safe. Uh, special thoughts out to uh, uh, colleagues and friends in the Sydney and New South Wales. Uh, it certainly um, sucks being back in lockdown, but um, I hope you guys uh, you know, are keeping well and safe. And uh, recently just heard our uh, good friends in Victoria as well have just recently been locked down as well for the next five days. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, that's for sure. But it's not all doom and gloom because I am back with the Q&A sessions. Apologies for the lack of Q&As. Uh, the last few weeks, uh, as you probably know, have been a little bit chaotic. So it's uh, sort of been a little bit of a, uh, for lack of a better term, nightmare to get things happening. But now it is back on, it is rolling, and I should be back on track with these on a regular basis. So uh, without uh, all the babbling, I just want to uh, talk about our guest this evening. So this evening, uh, I'm very privileged to be joined by a local jazz identity of the saxophone world here in Sydney and New South Wales. Uh, but, you know, he's also known across the country, uh, Raphael Carlin. Now, Raphael Carlin, or Raph, uh, which uh, I'll probably refer to just because it's Raphael's a bit of a mouthful. No apologies, Raph. Hopefully that's okay. Um, uh, is um, a award-winning saxophonist, composer, arranger. He's, you know, done many different things across a broad spectrum of styles and um, ensembles and, you know, he's just a, all, a, well, an awesome guy as well, lovely guy to talk to and, you know, really you know, interesting ideas and, um, you know, tonight's going to be an absolute pleasure to talk to him. But just to sort of give you a bit of a, a background of him, so Raf has released uh, several albums um, and he's worked with musicians such as... Uh, Kristen Barardi, uh, Mac McMahon, Brett Hurst, and Simon Barker. Um, he also has a trio with Barardi, uh, Foran, and himself, of course, Sean Foran. Um, and uh, he's toured uh, and won accolades from, uh, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Churchill Fellowships um, enabled him to, uh, you know, study overseas. Um, he's got a composer of residence at the Peggy, or had a, sorry, composer of residence at the Peggy Hill, uh, Glanville Hicks House in Sydney. Um, and, uh, you know, he's worked with, you know, lots of different people. Uh, Paul Mack, Andrea Keller, James Morrison, Megan Washington, Archie Roach, just to name a few. Um, I'm going to stop rambling now because, you know, this is like, you know, a huge rap sheet for people and it's probably best to get it from the horse's mouth. So without further ado, Raf, Raf, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Nathan. That's all right. Um, yeah, sorry for the long-winded introduction, but um, no, absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, so we'll just kick it off uh, with a nice simple one, and this is one I start with all the guests. Um, what made you pick the saxophone? Uh, sure, good question. Um, so I come from a musical family, but I wasn't interested in music um, for a long time. Um, my, uh, they tried with cello, you know, Suzuki method, really, really young, didn't grab at all. I was too busy running around outside, outside, um, tried guitar, tried piano. And my father was a guitarist, um, but no, nothing stuck till about 12, 13. And then my mother suggested saxophone. So I started there and then coincided with a good teacher. And I guess around the age of, you know, 13, 14, everyone gets obsessed with something. And it was kind of a good good place to have a um, very helpful teacher who um, that became my little obsession at that time. So I started reasonably late. I didn't really start properly till 13, 14. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, got, got into it and worked pretty hard in high school. So that helped. Cool. All right. Um, maybe you can talk to us about, um, you know, your student days on the saxophone. So like uh, some teachers that you've worked with, maybe some influential uh, things that sort of helped you, um, yeah. you know, progress along on the instrument and um, yeah, maybe just some, uh, yeah, interesting mentors or defining educational sure. moments. Sure. Um, I'm fortunate to have had quite a few wonderful teachers. Um, so my first serious teacher was um, a wonderful gentleman called Mal Cunningham. Um, he was originally a flute player here in Sydney. Um, but so up in um, Gold Coast Hinterland is essentially where I grew up. And um, he had, yeah, w was a very good classical musician. So that was helpful to get a nice grounding in um, how to play things well, uh, or try to at least be aware of what they should sound like, even if you can't get there. Um, and then at the con in Queensland, where I did my undergrad, I was fortunate to learn from Tony Hobbs. 
Oh, wow. Who, yeah. So I wasn't sure whether to do the jazz or classical. Um, I applied for both and um, did better on my classical, but I wanted to do jazz. So I, I selected the jazz stream and Tony Hobbs had, um, I mean, you know, he's not renowned for classical, his classical playing, but he did spend some time in Paris and did some things in a serious way. Um, and so I thought I could get a few things there. Um, he was wonderful, incredible musician, um, great arranger, great composer, beautiful section player, and was very helpful in um, not 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 making all the students sound like him. Um, so that was that was very helpful. So the, a few years just before I started the con, uh, wonderful saxophone players like Phil Noy and Zach Haran and Jacob Manrix and people like that had had just finished and they all sound completely different. Um, and th that's kind of nice because then everyone finds their place going, okay, cool, you can go this way, this way, this way. Um, I knew pretty early on I wasn't going to be a B. I I mean, I loved Charlie Parker and I loved Sonny Stitt and Dexter Gordon. Um, but specifically Bebop, I didn't find myself in that. Um, so then, yeah, at the con it was kind of, useful thinking okay if i don't uh, i love playing this but that doesn't feel as honest um so already then i was able to start writing and exploring what i felt more connection to because mm -hmm. um, it felt it, it did feel a bit weird you know growing up in well i was born in sweden as well so being uh -huh. born in sweden but growing up in australia and listening to jazz from the 50s in america um it's kind of a little bit of a weird how do you find yourself in all these different yeah places. it's quite an eclectic mix of things yeah mm. yeah, yeah so so th that's the that's the main saxophone and then i was lucky to have some wonderful lessons with um just a handful of lessons not many but you know julian wilson mm -hmm. um here in australia and they're the main teachers here in australia in terms of saxophone yep. um yeah and we'll probably get to the overseas ones yeah, yeah, yeah for sure yeah. so just to clarify before um you said you study at the con um mm -hmm. is that the queensland conservatory so yes queensland conservatory yeah, That's great. yeah we should uh should have mentioned before that uh you're actually a ex uh queenslander um who saw the light and came to new south wales <laughs> um so we're very glad to have you as part of our community but um you know we're happy to lend you back to queensland every now and again when they <laughs> um, need you so that's all good um so yeah as we were saying before uh, uh, you, you were sort of saying at the end there about some of your overseas studies now as i mentioned you got a few uh, uh grants and things that gave you the opportunity to go and study overseas mm -hmm. um things like uh, in uk and sweden um uh, maybe you can tell us about uh the church or fellowship like what was that for and um, who were the people that you were um, targeting for lessons and yeah, what did you get out of it? Yeah, cool. All right, heaps. Um, so the just to set things up, while I was at the con, um, so the Queensland Conservatorium, um, I was already writing quite a bit of music and starting to arrange and work with some larger ensembles, like Tempe's bands and big bands. Um, so those already sidestepping a little bit into that direction and a lot of a lot of writing um so that um a few different areas have been simmering for a while um uh, so with the what happened first <laughs> um so yeah i went i went and did my postgrad i did my master's in england i wasn't sure if i was going to study in sweden or england first mm -hmm. Um, I had some wonderful lessons um, in Sweden with a um, uh, lovely saxophone player, Carl, um, Carl Martin Almqvist. He's now in Denmark with the Danish radio big band. He's oh, wonderful. Wow. Yeah, he's great. A beautiful music. He's lived in New York for ages. And, um, um, and, but yeah, ended up going to York, the University of York, of all places. Weird really? um, destination. Yeah. The okay. reason I chose that one is because I really wanted to study with um, Julian Argelis, a beautiful tenor, well, saxophone player and writer. And I wanted to find somewhere where I could kind of pursue both avenues. And I wanted to align myself with people who had, um, who were doing what I wanted to be doing. So um, actually just prior to when, I, yeah, I got the idea for that because prior to going to England, I did a little mentorship and I was, already primed by thinking, I got a, a small mentoring grant to think 
uh, to have lessons with someone someone here in Australia. And I was like, oh, who in Australia is doing what I want to be doing? Who is writing to high, you know, what they want to write and playing what they want to play and kind of making it work. And the list is pretty short for the area I'm interested in. Mm. So, you know, it was a handful of people. It was like Mike Nock, Andre Keller, um, Paul Gaboski, they were kind of the short list. Um, I chose Mike um, and that was great. And so that kind of planted the seed. It was really, oh, I don't need to be with the saxophone player to learn music. Mm. Um, and that um, prompted me to, when I was looking at England, I was very into the music of Kenny Wheeler at oh, that yeah. time. Um, and that's that that harmonic language I felt more connection to than like the Great American Songbook. Um, so that's why I wanted to go to Europe to study. Um, it's also a little bit easier than trying to get to the States. Uh, States is pretty prohibitively expensive. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suppose um, being an EU uh, citizen, uh, well, having EU access to EU passports probably would have made it a bit easier. Well, yes and no. I found out at the time that I have, even though I was a citizen, I wasn't yeah, a resident. Yeah. So oh. I still had to pay international fees, which yeah. was a bit of a slap in the face. Um, I managed to get some funding, but it was like, cool, thank you for the funding. There you go. And just pass it off to the university instead of living on it. So worked part time instead, but um, that's fine. It's Ouch. character building. But um, <laughs> but um, but no, it was great. Wonderful to be in that space because Julian was a beautiful player and writer. And also John Taylor, the piano player who was on every every Kenny Wheeler album except um, New Deal one uh, or New High. Uh, the one with Keith Jarrett. Yeah, there's one album that was Keith Jarrett instead of John Taylor. So that was great just to be there. And also spending time with the classical people. It was a small institution. So you kind of rub shoulders with everyone. It wasn't like siloed like a lot of institutions are. Mm. So yeah, that was the that was the England. Um, then, sorry, a bit of a long story, but then the no, Churchill no. Fellowship. Um, so that was wonderful. I came back here and worked for a while doing music. And then, um, yeah, I was quite involved at that time with the Queensland Youth Orchestra Big Band, mm -hmm. uh, which was a lot of fun. And I was doing work with uh, the Queensland Music Festival um, and also teaching a little bit at Young Con and a little bit at the Conservatorium as well. Um, so just a quite a few different things. So the whole Ch Winston Churchill Fellowship is they want to support people going overseas, learn with some of the best people they can get hold of and then come back and share that knowledge with um, the community in Australia. So I was fortunate to be in a great position where I could learn all these great things, bring them back and then hopefully relay as much as I could to everyone I was in contact with through my playing and writing and um, yelling directions in front of the band. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I made a big hit list of it was a great exercise, really fun. Like if you could make a list of all the people in the world you'd like to spend time with and then start there and work your way down the list. Um, thankfully, I didn't have to go very far down the list. Um, I was so very, very happy that a lot of people replied. And um, yeah, I, my goal was to learn about ensemble directing um, slash conducting, but ensemble directing in a broader sense, mm -hmm. saxophone playing and composition and some arranging actually. Um, and yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, New York. So um, some of the highlights, the arrangers were um, you know, Vince Mendoza and the Metropole Orchestra for a while, um, Jim McNeely, um, the HR Big Band, Danish Radio Big Band, um, then England. Um, some people I, that are floating under the radar, but like some wonderful arrangers, like um, John Metcalf, who did the Peter Gabriel album, Scratch My Back, and just okay. all these, yeah, really interesting. Um, people that I just wanted to have lessons with sessions of like they're doing interesting things regardless of where they were so some Norwegian art music um some yeah Turk Versailles a wonderful tenor player uh Tor Gustafsson Arild Anderson a bass player uh Dave Douglas trumpet player um Tony Malby sax player um Darcy James Argue in New York um, incredible arranger um yeah there's a lot there are a lot of a lot more people I'm sure I'm forgetting but um, yeah, that thing about each person I want to meet, I had a list of questions I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to pick their brains on how do you do this this way? Why do you do that? How do you approach these different things, these different challenges? What do you think of when you do this? So, thankfully, I was able to watch 
a lot of people work. So spend some time watching people rehearse or those projects maybe with a special guest and they'll rehearse for three days intensively. Um, but that, that, that focus of what do you want to learn, who can help you learn it was helpful. And those situations where you have resources to make that possible was a luxury. So yeah, for sure. Mm. Oh wow! Sounds like a fantastic um, experience. Yeah, yeah, it's very bridged, and I'm I'm sure I'm dropping lots of things. But um, if you're interested, there is um on the Churchill Fellowship, Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship um website, they have all the you have to write a report, so everyone writes yep. their things. I've tried to make it as non-sterile as possible, so you know, it's like this is these are some things I learned. <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah it was really fun. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I'll, I might um shoot up a link. Sure. In, the, in the video about that and i'll try and find a link directly to that so you don't have to troll through all the, the yeah no, I, I'll find yeah. It. Send yeah. <laughs> that's cool um so uh yeah we uh, sort of touched on um yeah the churchill thing uh and uh yeah your your master's degree so it, w it was a coursework thing it was was it a research thing coursework or was it um yeah um it was uh a bit of both. It was pretty, it's a bit of an open institution, that one. Um, so technically it was a coursework master's yep. and the, the research was the music. Um, it was, so it was a portfolio, composition portfolio was the majority of the assessment. Right. Um, okay. And that was where I first started writing for strings. Um, cool. So prior to that, I'd been writing for jazz ensembles, um, 10 piece bands, big bands, smaller groups, but, um, half my um yeah 50 percent the major work was I don't know, maybe 10 10 works for string quartet piano and saxophone mm -hmm. and i was really interested in exploring how you integrate improvising soloists in the framework of a classical classical-ish um chamber ensemble and um yeah that ended up turning into i don't know second album the the sweetness of things half remembered that string, uh, string album and that was that was really fun it, it, it was nice to control um it was actually really hard because you know, when you write jazz you kind of you know how to work within the conventions the mm -hmm. chord chart lead sheet whatever it might be so you don't have to write out everything you don't have to be so prescriptive but then with uh string musicians and classical musicians you have to be like okay what do i actually want because you're not going to get it if you don't write it yeah uh, or give really detailed descriptions which can be quite convoluted so um yeah so masters was focusing on that um and a bit of a justification exegesis on what i was trying to do um and it was good yeah it was, it was i got a lot out of it it was pretty intense it was one year masters so it was pretty action-packed wow um, yeah, yeah one, one year for masters is um yeah it, for those who don't know it usually is about two years so yeah it's double the amount of work in less of the time and i can only imagine what that would have been like <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, it, was, it was it was it was good uh, it was yeah up there with uh but you made lots of made lots of you learn you learn so much it's mm -hmm. like okay cool and then you can use it later so it was helpful cool cool um, so, uh, uh, what, like all these wonderful experiences and um, opportunities that you got to study with people, um, are there any sort of particular figures that really stood out for you um, along the way? And if so, what was it that, or was it a lesson or was it uh, something they might have said or shown you that has really stuck with you to this day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, heaps. Um, I've, uh, probably the same for you. I mean, when, when we teach, you know, these things just come out. Um, mm. And or when we work, like when I'm trying to write something, like trying to take my own advice, you know, stuff stuff you've heard, and it's like trying to um, integrate with whatever project you're working on. Heaps. Um, so some of the some of the key things, I'll, I'll just list a few things that come sure. to mind straight away. Um, first one, uh, John Rogers, wonderful a violinist composer. Uh, flamenco guitarist uh yeah just an incredible force of music um he he was at the one of the teachers kind of more informally um when i was studying and he i remember asking him why he stayed in music when a lot of people around the same time something might have gotten jaded or uh, kind of did something else um 
And I was also intrigued because this is a, John is a musician who would play in a blues band one night, write a composition for the Elysian Ensemble the next week, and then write a, a musical or a, a musical theater piece or something. Wow. And just have all these different hats that he could um, understand, you know, new complexity stuff and just jam out on a blues. Um, and it was like, how can you fit? How can you find yourself in all those spaces while still be honest and um and and not hate it and um his his answer was he liked music too much so i was like oh that makes it simple great thank you um so that was, that was a really important thing realizing that it's okay to um I think that was another comment someone made in england um professor bill brooks um he said uh because i asked him how he could be such a, a f someone who has a lot of understanding of choral music and old school choral music and lots of new stuff and also be an academic and just like really good at all of them and he was saying you know just take down the walls um if you view that if there aren't walls you can do anything you like i was like oh okay that sounds good so they're they're important things in terms of musical things so i struggled a bit with nerves um and that can be a big thing when you're improvising um, to, you know, when you catch yourself and you stumble and then you, it's hard to get back on track. And um, I, remember, I remember asking a teacher about how he navigates that. And he said, oh, if, if you just use your ears, yeah, everything becomes a musical problem, not a technical one. Um, I was like, mm, cool, that's good. Noted, I remember that. So, you know, just taking a step back and trying to engage more with the bigger picture mm. and, um how you yeah yeah i'm sure i could find heaps of heaps more but they're the first ones that come to mind um and i guess along the way people would have encouraged or made made me question if i'm not going to do this you know if i'm not going to sound like coltrane or charlie parker or a mixture of the two then um how who do i want to be sounding like who do i resonate with and trying to find that um whether in composition or playing is a really yeah has been a big focus so that they're kind of some important nuggets that have cool. been with me yeah no they're all great ones um yeah particularly the improv one like um yeah there's i'm sure you know everyone sort of experienced that at one mm. stage where you know they kind of you know have that you know blank moment and oh what do i do and yeah that's that's great advice really mm. um now uh, you actually uh, at the end there it really summed up really nicely because you're talking about you know uh, you know you, you don't want to sound like you know x and y but you know who do you want to sound like so my next question is and this could be a two-parter in terms of uh, sure. uh, playing wise and compositionally mm -hmm. who are some of uh, your musical influences and why do they resonate with you mm -hmm. uh so <laughs> i guess there's just in terms of progression and might be helpful so the f one of the first jazz albums i really got into was john coltrane's crescent um which is a beautiful album and i didn't realize how um so it's the album just before just after just before i think it's just before love supreme i don't know just either side of it um and just really beautiful and that's probably yeah it's still my favorite coltrane album i think but that I connect with it. I love listening to it, but I never really could play like that. And same thing with Parker, I'd be like so beautiful, like just so much spontaneity. And Lee Kronitz, um, who'd have these amazing twists and turns, but make it sound like it's the, the exact right thing that needs to happen. Um, and spend time. And Joe Henderson, um, who would make everything sound so considered and so right as well. Um, they were really key people in the straight ahead on the straight ahead in jazz um, at that early on for me. Um, then I kind of came across Jan Gabarek and that was really helpful, really important for me because I was like that thing of you know, being a, um, a sax player in Norway at the time, getting really into like Coltrane and Albert Eiler and lots of stuff and realizing what, what, what what relevance or authority or you know all these all these questions which are really important to ask um what connection do you have to that music um and that that 
that plants some important seeds. So then I was able to follow that. And I guess I started connecting more with Kenny Wheeler and a lot of European music at that time. Sorry, um, ECM music. Because um, to me, it integrated. I was still listening to a lot of classical music and studying a lot of scores and transcribing a lot of um, yeah, weird things I just like the sound of. A lot of classical things. I was like, oh, that's great. Um, and realizing there were people who would just kind of take what they needed. And also, I guess that's the lesson from, it's not new. I mean, people were doing that. Parker was doing that. They would just take everything they liked at that point and you do something with it. And that's what they did. And then it became um, defined as something. Um, but in terms of players, um, they were, that's where I started. Um, then kind of grew, got a bit, yeah. Some other key people were um, are lately really enjoying Trig Vesheim, a Norwegian tenor player, or and soprano yeah. player. Um, beautiful tone and does his thing and does his thing beautifully and realizing that um, you don't have to be which is a hard one. And this is some, a conversation we can probably come back to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a sax player, you we're kind of expected to be able to play all the saxophones, a lot of the styles, and do well at all those things, um, which is really hard. Um, yeah. So, and, and that's where we can come back to. But then realizing that there are these players, musicians who are just doing what they do and what they want to do and making it sound beautiful. And that's, that's their you know, either content with it or they stand behind it. Um, and that, that was important for me is to realizing that I can, it's enough to find what you like and try to do that well. Mm. Yeah, um, no, for sure. And uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. no so that, that just, that's, that's more saxophone stuff. Um, okay. I guess in, in composer, composition, there's just, you know, lots of different, but we can, yeah, that, that, that's a longer conversation. Lots of different, you know, there's jazz people, there's classical people, there's people who do both, there's uh, non, you know, stuff that might be pop or whatever. Lots of different things. Yeah, there's a whole spectrum of things. Um, I was just trying to look up um, uh, a tenor player. Uh, just trying to, uh, where is it? Um, oh, here he is. Marius Nezet. You ever yeah. Come across he, him? He's great. He's a yeah. beast. Yeah. Just awesome. Awesome playing and just awesome. Yeah, pieces and stuff. Just yeah, was, yeah, he's, he's, he's terrifying. Yeah, like yeah. so, just makes it sound so easy. And his writing is amazing too. Yeah, he's um, the the stuff he did uh, come out of his London Philharmonia, the, the London film. The, the, there's a yeah, an orchestra mm. in England that he did stuff with, and the new one with um, the Danish radio big band's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. Miho arranged that. Um, yeah, now it's just a monster because I know he's he's uh, also an ex, uh, in the UK now, the expat scandinavian yeah 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 no i've not interacted with him but um no i'd love to he's great yeah he's... yeah cool all right um anyway we should probably move on um sure. now uh, we'll talk about your playing uh now uh, I, I i didn't do enough justice unfortunately in the intro on the scale of the things that you've done but you know you've uh worked you know across australia um with you know a, a large range of you know ensembles and musicians high profile musicians and ensembles i should say mm -hmm. and um you know in a, in a, a broad range of settings as well like uh, you know sort of varying into um uh, you know soul jazz pop folk uh and classical artists as well like it's just yeah it's amazing um maybe uh uh just with all the the projects that you've been involved with there's several standout ensembles uh, we sort of touched on a few but uh maybe we'll talk about your most recent project uh, which we were just talking about before um and this is the eucalyptus trio i believe so this is like a, re a bit of a pun on here folks apparently i'm told it's eucalyptus tree as in t-r-e-e-o and um, you uh, actually won a ABC Jazz Commission Award for this a couple of weeks ago. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the um, uh, about the group and how the project came about. Sure. Um, so uh, I guess a couple of things. So yeah, I'm, I'm super, super lucky to have played with lots of different things um, and and working always with some incredible musicians in different areas. Um, now it's an interesting thing when you relocate because then you kind of re re reinvent yourself wherever you are mm -hmm. um, and kind of have to build up 
new connect new connections each each place you go. So it's been um, when the calls don't the default calls don't come in anymore. So you're like, okay, if I'm not busy, what do I want to be busy doing? Which is great because anything. Okay, cool. What project do I want to be doing? Because the phone's not ringing. Um, so it's spending energy planning that. And this new one. Um, so there are three things on the go at the minute. One is this trio with um, Eucalyptus Trio, which is with Steve Barry on piano. He's a beast. And Hannah James on bass. She's awesome. We're all going to write three tunes each. And we're going to record those later. Everything's you know, a bit of a tricky time right now to get a timeline. Well, but, um, yeah, yeah. Probably in the next six months at some point, towards the end of the six months. Um, and we're going to unravel... Well, address, not even unravel our address, but explore the different shifting histories of and roles of national parks. Um, we, we all like hiking, so I thought it was nice to have something which we bring from our non-music world into our music world, because there's overlap anyway. Um, and yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, un unpack some of those themes, and it's, an, it's a nice format. Um, bass, piano, drums, nice. Sorry, bass, piano, saxophone. Um, yeah, it's nice and transparent and warm. So it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty. Nice, very cool. Um, so the um, yeah. So as you said, six months down the track, there'll be something there. So we'll keep an eye out for that once you know things um lighten up here, and then be able to actually get to work on that. But um, yeah, some of your your uh, previous uh, groups I was saying about um in particular uh the Barati Foran and Carlin trio and they seem to be a lot of work here maybe you tell us a bit about this project sure um so that that trio started i'm gonna say 2014 2014 15 around there it's i was i received a fun little commission from um the declassified music festival in brisbane mm -hmm. and it was a, it was a really cool commission it was you walk into an art gallery and pick a painting you like and write something inspired by it for a performance in the gallery. Um, so I was like, cool, great. So I um, wanted to have, yeah, voice, piano, saxophone. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a beautiful painting in, uh, called Bushfire Break, um, and it was just really striking uh, red, orange lines like this with a little black. Um, cut in the middle and then just so it was really strong movement through it and um that was really helpful to for imagery and think about how can you not necessarily represent it but reflect on that or be inspired by that so that was the first thing i wrote for that trio um or what turned into be that trio and um kristen brady and sean foreign uh yeah they're both incredible musicians and mm -hmm. their powerhouses with everything they do um and it's it's that was one of the few times for me where jazz ensembles don't really work like bands. Um, so it was new or or timbre ensembles, people who rehearse regularly. That's not common in the jazz world. Uh, it happens, but I hadn't experienced it very much. Um, most ensembles I had when I was starting out, I was really excited because I'd book the best, you know, book all my teachers. So amazing players but never any time to rehearse so you yeah. just if you're lucky you get a rehearsal uh, otherwise you just do it on the gig and you learn how to how to roll with the gig mm. which is also a great experience um but then finding yourself with several musicians who are keen to work on things develop things i was like oh wow that makes that's great i should do this more i mean i was after, after many years after graduating from the conservatory i realized that i was like great um but the first album we did with that trio was called um, hope in my pocket and we we received some funding to explore um letters diaries and journal entries from anzac soldiers okay oh sorry correspondence so it was oh, between, okay. um yeah wives soldiers governments just all these different elements from world war one because it was to mark the centenary and that was a that was a chunky project i spent months reading through letters and journals from state archives and uh, National War Museum and, um, uh, sorry, National, uh, I'm getting, uh, on Canberra, my, my, my brain's escaped me, but, um, and State Library in okay. Queensland. Yeah, so yeah, and building these things and thinking about themes. And it was really, that was important project for me because I hadn't really had a bigger arc for an album before. Um, 
and just albums are normally a bunch of pieces you write and they're written around the same time so you use them at the same time and that's your album but that that was like okay how how can we address this how can we pull this apart how can you make a progression over the whole um 60 minutes whatever it might be and what themes will you explore how do you split that up co-writing it was really it was a really great process and then we did another album after that with a european um vibraphone player because we're like oh it's a weird weird instrumentation anyway voice saxophone <laughs> and piano how do you and what do you bring into that so um and the same thing there it's like how do you bring in that, that new personality how can you consider personally um instrumentally what were they going to bring how can you exploit that and maximize that um yeah so that's that trio Kristen now lives in um switzerland she's mm -hmm. taken up a teaching position over there oh, and wow. um, sean's in brisbane still and i'm here so a bit of a pause um yep. and the so Kristen, uh the one of the other projects i have is also with Kristen. it's a quintet mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me and that's meant to launch it was meant to tour last year launch a new album but last year didn't really happen um so yeah. so that's been paused to this year and i'll probably have nadia nordhouse a trumpet player um being Kristen for that so it's gonna be wonderful nice fantastic um, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, you got a lot of different things on your plate, which is a great being a musician, um, lots of different things to, you know, keep yourself busy. Um, but, uh, yeah, sort of moving on with that, um, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, some notable groups that you've worked with. Mm -hmm. Um, what about, uh, performance and performance experiences? Are there any mm -hmm. sort of, uh, it's a tricky one, I know, because, um, you know, they're all, they're all great experiences, but do you have any particular concert highlights or uh, gig mm -hmm. highlights that stick out for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first ones which come to mind, um, one of the biggest ones for me was um, just yeah, in 2016, um, just after I finished the Churchill Fellowship, I came back to um, perform with the Queen, uh, Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Um, it was chamber, chamber ensemble, so it was like one of each. It was pretty small. Um, and there was a, a feature concert of i had license to do what i wanted so i thought oh, i'll write everything i'll play it'll be great um how I, um so that was that kept me busy um <laughs> but having come that was a really important thing for me being like hearing my stuff come to life with um an ensemble like that and just having yeah it was very indulgent it was lovely um and that, that was a standout some beautiful performances with Kristen and sean um uh, really nice intimate music like that and then um big bands are always fun i've been fortunate to be in front of quite a few big bands and sometimes they feature me um it's great when you're when you're in charge of writing the music you can kind of just write yourself in which is what i do um so if there's someone i want to work with i just kind of write for them and myself at the same time so it's great um the some non-jazz ones which are really important as performers were um and they were just like kind of not even very organized I, when i was involved with the queensland music festival um i would go up to yarrabah um near Cairns, and that was great that was, it was incredible and that's where i one year was able to um be musical director which meant writing and arranging music for uh or even just one just a couple of pieces for community musicians high school kids i think even some primary school students and some professional musicians so it was like a big mashup of all these different levels and that was a really incredible experience because that's where uh, that was the first time i had archie roach live and um that was one of the most powerful things like hearing um um you know just standing there waving just pointing directing traffic on stage and um and just hearing just the, the force he would sing with was um very special and yeah, that was definitely wow. a stand-up moment. Yeah, wow, phenomenal. Yeah, lucky. Yeah, mm. it sounds amazing. Uh, actually, yeah, that, and sorry, and also sitting in once with Yothi Yindi there as well. Uh, oh, just, wow. uh, just a sudden, oh, I was just like an informal thing. I just scratched out a, a horn chart for um, 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 Japana, and that was so just one one, and we just had a bunch of musicians who happened to be there. So we had an impromptu horn section and. That was the energy those guys played with. That was that was a standout as well. Just really, yeah, next level. 
That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, I was about to say there's no horns in um, your for Indie, but no, no, not yet. Oh, not I'll, yet. I'll work on it. I'll see what you're working on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Oh, awesome. Um, now, uh, another question for you, more of a, um, a pick your brains kind of moment here. So, uh, you know, no doubt, you know, you have a plethora of experience under your belt and, you know, you've worked, uh, as I said before, some amazing musicians and ensembles. Um, what advice could you give to younger musicians who are looking to break into the scene uh, to be a professional musician um, in terms of, you know, w what can they do to sort of help them sort of, you know, develop and grow in this, um, it, well, for lack of a better term, it, it can be quite a, a brutal scene to be involved in. So Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, sure. So that that is a good question because it's not enough to be a good musician for most of the time. Uh, for most of us, it's not enough to be a good musician. And then um, there are just so many amazing players. Uh, and there's no shortage of incredible saxophone players, for example, or composers. Um, so how to... Uh, I guess there are a few... few uh, be, be aware of what else is needed, I think, is an important one. So um, having a bigger plan and not and just actually doing it as opposed to waiting for someone else to help you. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing because um, it's yeah gone are the days where, you know, in the jazz world, you might join a big band tour, cut your teeth, or you get picked up by some, some um, reputable band leader and you tour with them and you, then you have a profile, like that kind of mentoring thing isn't, doesn't exist anymore mm. for the most part or for, for the rest of us anyway. Um, and so thinking about what you want to do how you're going to do it and how you can maybe get help to do that so there are um australia is i mean it, it, it's a weird one because we do have support in a lot of ways but we, culture is necessarily valued mm. um so it's great that we have access to a lot of funding grant opportunities they're very competitive and often underfunded but the fact that it exists is really helpful so um, the process of writing grants is helpful thinking about, because it forces you to refine your own picture. What are you trying to do? How are you going to do it? Why do you want to do it? Those three questions are very, very helpful to whatever project you want to do. Um, so being a bit strategic about planning ahead. Um, so I would have a wish list of different projects I wanted to work on. So a big band thing, want to write for this project or explore this or uh, work with those people, a small group thing, exploring this, work with those people, where can that be performed? And let's make a list of how, where can things happen, how I'm going to do it, um, who, will, who I'll play it with. And that's, that's kind of helpful. And then I did try to educate myself a lot on the music industry, which is gross. I avoided it a lot. Like music business scared, like I just was repelled by the concept of it. I really regret not doing those music business classes at, that were on offer while I was studying because I had to learn it later. So then I, you know, pay for one-on-one -on -one sessions with people and be like, how do you release an album? How do you write a grant? I don't know. Yeah. So, well, um, that, that's the true thing. Like there's a lot of people, you, you know, you do a tertiary degree and you're out there and hmm. there's a lot of stuff like that, that you're not really shown or taught or explained how to do. So, you know, if the yeah, opportunities for that come across in your uni degree, go for it. Like, you know, hmm. that wouldn't hurt. Mm, absolutely and and these and we, we are kind of solid if you're in a classical field you kind of expose you, you expect to graduate and find some position somewhere or uh if you yeah like what's at the end of it and then yeah the reality kicks in and then you kind of think okay well, how do i do, how do other people do it mm. how can i try to emulate that no exactly spot on um uh, like for me my own experiences um so my undergrad course was a classical course and yes. um classical saxophone as we know doesn't have a, <laughs> any openings in a no. openings in an orchestra so yeah, very few yeah well i mean you do but it's usually casual work so you get yes. one or two gigs a year and you know the course is structured around you to uh, develop a, and you know become a orchestral musician so for us you know a sort of square peg round hole and uh, as you rightly said like you know after uni and you know towards the end of uni um you had to start thinking about well how do we fit in and you know uh, as you were saying before like what are the gaps in the market what could you do and um, you know trying to uh forge your own path should we say yeah no that's 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 a thing like the 
it, it, it's, and this is a really weird balance because I, I have friends who are responsible for um, designing university degrees and or in any music, like what should it do? Should it be turning people out who have industry awareness or should they be able to play their instrument? Because they, they, there, there are final, finite amount, there's a finite amount of resources that universities have and also that students can do. So mm. which ones do you value? Do you try to get someone who can play saxophone in all these different styles or someone who's really good at the one thing they want to do? Um, and these, these are big questions and I don't necessarily know the answers, um, but I think it's useful considering um, having an understanding of what the expectations are in the real world and, and what opportunities there are and trying to overlay that with what you want. And you, I think it'd be sad if you just do gigs to do, well, I would be sad if I just did gigs that I didn't have any emotional connection to. Mm. Um, there are, I have lots of friends who are hired guns and they, they're great. They, they thrive on being able to jump in on any gig and nail it. And they're, they're incredible. They could do a session here. They could na nail all these wedding covers. They could do site read some awesome big band thing, do some pit work. Um, and for, for a long time, I thought I wanted to do that and be, well, I wanted to be able to do it. Even if I didn't want to do it, I wanted to know that I could because it kind of validates itself as a saxophone player mm. but realizing that uh, i'm okay i don't need to know those top 40 tunes inside out i'd rather spend my energy doing something that um that i'll do either way if i'm getting paid for it cool if i'm not i'll do it anyway and then trying to do more of those then eventually they if there is some money coming in through those great um, yeah. um because that's where you it's seldom someone's going to give you an opportunity out of the blue and say, here, here's some money, do a gig, whatever you want to do. Mm. Um, you know, normally people will find you for doing what you want already doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, all right. Um, now just in terms of your, uh, moving on to some composition sure. stuff that you do. Uh, now we talked about you, where you studied and, and, uh, yeah, some, oh, some of the people that you studied composition and some of the things sort of touched briefly on mm -hmm. some projects that you've done as a composer but how did you get into composing like mm -hmm. was it a, sort of a natural progression from um say improvising on the saxophone was interested in creating or was there some other uh, catalyst there um i so i started writing when i was at university and i was it was quite informal i was writing because i wanted to write i was studying scores i was um wanting to generate material that I felt a connection to. And, and I was fortunate that my saxophone teacher was Tony Hobbs, who himself was a fantastic uh, arranger and writer. So I could bring something in and um, he would, you know, would sit at the piano and say, that's great, why are you doing this chord? You could also do this, 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 you know, and nail or just describe 12 other options for that one, one note, harmonizing that one note. And I'd be like, ah, um, so that was really helpful. And that's kind of where I started um, pretty early on. I guess my second year of university, I was writing pretty serious, well, seriously. I was writing, a, yeah, I was writing some big band charts and some material for a 10 piece band. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, I guess it was just lined up nicely because at that time there was a um, monthly reading session with which is organized by Steve Newcomb and Laura Carl, mm -hmm. uh, who's a composer li now living in New York. And that happened once a month, musicians would get together and those read through whoever wanted to bring, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> whoever wanted to bring in a chart. Um, I'm losing my voice, I'm talking too much. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, it's all good. Um, yeah, so that was really helpful. Whoever wanted to write a chart, bring it in, musicians will play. Sweet. It was like a reading session, informal. Yeah. It was great, um, and that's kind of where I started. So I was studying. I was studying classical scores, um, not really applying them, just for my own interest. Um, so actually, no, it's like harmonically. I'll be like, oh, cool. This is a great voicing from whatever the piece it might be. I remember looking at a um, goodbye. Uh, I, I never know how to pronounce her names. Goodbye, 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 Delina. Goodbye, Delina. Yeah. Yeah. Sophia, goodbye, Delina. Yeah. Um, her 
was it Offer Torium, the, the violin one um, with um, Giron Kramer? It's, it's yeah, beautiful. I remember studying oh. the score for that, which is like heavy and just hitting all these big, big chords and voicings. And it was like, wow. And then next, it'll just move to these really beautiful harmonies. So I guess for me, it was just a, a very playful ex exploration of sounds I like and then writing melodies I like over the top of those chords. So from that point of view, the improvising was very helpful because you try you get better at hearing a response you play something and then you try to respond to what you just played or what someone else is playing so it, it's an unfolding of wherever you start hmm. in i guess in a purer sense so then um the composition for me was just playing around with that starting somewhere and then trying to refine and twist and explore something and let it unravel and see which direction it goes cool um, yeah so um, your uh, the process for you to compose, um, <laughs> like how do you like? I know everyone's very different and unique yeah. in how they do it, but what what would be sort of your um, atypical approach to say starting a composition? Do you start like on the saxophone as well, here on the piano, uh, mm -hmm. or do you have a different method? I would love to be more efficient as a composer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very slow and. The, I was um, incredibly fortunate a few years ago. The reason I moved to Sydney was in 2018, as you mentioned, I was uh, lucky to get the Peggy Glendale Hicks um, residency, mm -hmm. which is um, an opportunity to live in, a, in this beautiful house that belonged to Peggy Glendale Hicks as a trust that she set up um, and write music for 12 months. And that's, that's the objective. It's just a dream. Um, so that, th the reason I'm bringing this up is that made me question everything even more. Um, because you're in the space to write all this music and then you kind of get a block because you, there's this expectation and that, that's where it's hard just trying to keep it playful and um and not get take everything too seriously even you know if you're an amazing in an amazing space mm. so for me i don't actually compose on the saxophone i'd like to try um because i am much better on saxophone than i am on piano um but i do i do noodle on piano so okay. um i'm very slow i'm not good at reading but like my harmony is okay so i can kind of look at chords and, and make things um and then see what might fit over that i am um normally they kind of grow together um one thing i would like to get better at and this is because i'm coming from a jazz side more so than classical composition so i'm largely self-taught as a composer i should justify i've had some great lessons and uh, having some now, trying to get my craft a bit better. But most of the time, it's um, kind of, yeah, figure it out. Um, jazz, I'm thinking very vertically. You know, used to thinking, here's a chord, this is what will work over that. Here's another chord, this is what will work over that. Mm. Um, whereas a lot of, there's so many other ways to compose. So uh, right now, I'm thinking more, trying to think more linearly as opposed to horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, but my process is, uh, either depends what it is sometimes it might be exploring a uh, theme so the, the the thing which is stressing me out at the moment um is i'm writing six write 60 minutes of music for a string orchestra and a choir um and that's a chunky one and that's due very soon um and and they're, they're amazing ensembles so camerata and the australian voices um and i wanted to unravel this incredible story of Hazenkeif, a city in Turkey, which has been flooded. Um, it's been flooded for the new Ilusu Dam project. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, it's not a new project. has been going for ages, but it's just been flooded. And this is a 12,000 year old city, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. And it's now submerged underwater. And a lot of these Neolithic caves and things have just been washed away. Wow. Um, yeah, I think it's going to ow. So when I first heard of this a couple of years ago, um i want yeah it just made me feel all these different things so i wanted to try to unpack what i was feeling and um so in that one i have made a very big list of all the different elements of this bigger story that i'm going to try to explore and um investigate musically and that's different because that has text as well so right. um but yeah composition always lots of playing around on the piano for me cool all right now um you uh, 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 uh as I said, well, you had said as well, um, you know, you've written for in all sorts of different 
um, ensembles and uh, types of chamber groups and choirs and you know all sorts of different configurations. Um, do you have a any particular favourite uh, compositional uh, composition project or work that you worked on? And if so, why why does it stand out for you? Uh, that's tricky. They all they all have their different. Um, I guess with each with each um, project, there's been a few more pieces that are more successful and they're representative of that little excursion isn't the wrong word, but that that um, direction. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I guess it was really important. I have a handful. There's, I remember there's there a big band piece I wrote. Um, I was quite young um, and I held on to it for a while and then I submitted it for a competition. Um, and it was really great to hear it come to life and hear it played by a big band and that it reinforced the language I wanted to use. The um, it legitimized me. It I was like, oh, cool. That it's okay to do what I want to be doing because that piece was just written for me to explore different voicings. Like remember the first chords, um, B flat on C, and I was like, oh, that's a great sound. <laughs> and and just just literally trying to get all these really colorful chords and then flesh that out for a big band, and. So that was probably the first important piece that I wrote um, for Big Band. The String Project, the first one I did um, with the sweetness of things half remembered, that was that, that was nice because a, a colleague came up to me afterwards and he said, um, for the first time he, he heard what I was trying to write because previously I've been writing for jazz bands and 10 piece bands and things. And he thought the strings was much more suited to what I was trying to do musically than the piece I just wrote before that. Um, yeah, hard question to answer. I'll, I'll get back to you. Yeah, that's okay. I, I, yeah, it's sort of a bit of a curveball, but um, I, I mean, it's safe to say that you know, there's a lot of enjoyable projects that you've worked on for sure. Um, now, uh, uh, sort of talking about what before in terms of you know, your, sharing your experiences and advice, mm -hmm. um, what kind of advice would you provide to a performer who would be looking into delving into some composing? Like what sort of things would you suggest they can start off if they're interested in sort of pursuing that compositional uh, side of things yeah. as well as performing? Sure, um, I guess the like playing, if, if you're not listening, it, you're not really connecting with it. Um, so um, listening to pieces and trying to go, what do you enjoy the sound of? And then taking that a step further and go, why do you like the sound of that? What is it that you like about it? Um, is it the, the the melody, the line that's going through? Is it the harmony? Is it the the way it fits together? Is it the color of it? Um, and I think that's helpful because that makes you that kind of curates your experience of what you want um, and are seeking out. So that's I think the first step. Then um, being aware, just pulling melodies apart like pieces and going, what what's happening here? Why is this awesome? Um, and then looking a bit analytically, I guess one bit of advice I have is don't try to do the analysis and, sorry, not the, the analytical side of things and the creative side at the same time. Mm -hmm. So someone once described it to me as two hats. One is generate material, yep. um, um, play around, don't censor, just generate things. Then put it somewhere take a different role and go, what can I do with this? How can I process is a uh, sterile word, but how can I unravel this? How can I expand this? How can I use mm. this and turn it into a composition? Um, and that, that's where the, you know, the craft comes in in some way, because then you think, okay, the melody would work here. This should be here. I can harmonically put it here. Rhythmically, it's boring. I could make it more interesting. Whatever <laughs> you can start throwing throwing different tools at it, and that's where you can kind of pull on all these devices from other pieces that you like, and go, okay, I'm going to do this. And a good place is like playing. You you copy people, so mm -hmm. you might learn some chords from a piece of music that you really like, um, some voicings, and go, okay, how can I write a melody through that, or vice versa? Approach someone else's melody. How can you harmonize that differently? Um, and just to explore different things because it's, um, at least for me, I need to, every piece I've written is 
me trying to learn something new um, okay. to apply something that I wanted to learn. Nice. And would that be a similar thing for arranging as well, like sort of exploring ideas, or is it a, a, a difference to that? Um, arranging is an interesting one. I have I've done a, I've done more writing than I have arranging, but I've done some weird arranging, which is great. So I really enjoy it because it, it's so different from what I normally do. So if I do something for a singer songwriter, um, trying to listen and go, what does the music need? And it's great because I'm not attached to it. When it's your own thing, it's, it's you're precious. You, you kind of, it's almost too close. So yeah. then sometimes taking a step back and going, okay, here's the material. What, which directions can it go? How can you support whatever vision that tune has? Um, it's for me, it's a bit more invisible in the arranging because then you um, trying to support something that's already there and most of the arranging I've done has been if there's a pre-existing recording and then you add strings, uh, there might be a demo or add horns or something. Um, right. Yeah, sometimes sometimes you might be given a tune and you can really twist and turn it and do something completely new. And that's fun because then you can have more of a fingerprint on it. Um, and then, yeah, I guess it's less, no, I, I take it back. I'll, I'll be trying, I'll be doing research from someone else as well. Be like, how do other arrangers do this? Mm. Um, how do they, and then I'll try to apply something as well. So I do, I do try to use something new. Otherwise, I feel a bit fraudulent because if you kind of know what you're going to get, it, it's not as exciting for me as, or anyone. Like, I don't know, probably, probably because I haven't done enough yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. No, interesting. Um, great. All right. Now, um, in conjunction with all your uh, performance work and co composing work and, and arranging, of course, um, you're also a wonderful teacher and educator. And you know, you've taught at many, um, many places uh, up in Queensland. I know uh, you taught at, uh, which is now known as JMI, um, at the con up there and a few other uh, schools and institutions. Um, and currently in Sydney, uh, you have a couple of uh, studios at a few schools and also um, some other bits and pieces as well. Um, how would you describe your sort of general teaching philosophy? Um, um, I guess the, the the teaching I'm doing now is all is all saxophone. Uh, no, a little bit ensemble. I do no, actually. That, that's like yeah. I like the ensemble stuff as well because then you can talk bigger music, not just yeah. technique. Um, I'm not doing any arranging or composition teaching at the moment, so that one's on standby. But I guess I'd try to relay excitement about music and getting inside it. Um, so if um, it's so, there's so much music out there, um, so there's trying trying to keep it different, mm. um, trying to trying to help students engage with it because there's so much responsibility like I'd, I'd, I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have all the great teachers out along the way um, and have, trying to convey that that sincere connection that the, those teachers had to music I mean the, the um, I mean I'm not saying you have to be a great performer to be a great teacher but you have to enjoy the music to be a great teacher um, if, yeah. if yeah, if you don't, then I think you're kind of faking it. So I guess trying to throw all these different things because I do I do like lots of music that doesn't have a saxophone. So trying to you know draw parallels that it's all music, it's not all um, just that corner. You know. Yeah, yeah. Whether Come they're on. listening to Triple J or whatever, like it's it all comes together. Like whether it's harmony or rhythm, what what's going on there? So trying to get people to listen and engage with the music, I think would be a nice goal. Yeah, exactly. No, nice one. Um, if you, you might have already answered this, but if there was one thing that you wanted your students to take away uh, from lessons with you, what would it be? Um, I guess to find material that they like um, and to find to like playing something 
um, whether that's, you know, whatever, just some engagement with music in some way. So there's some connection, um, I think would be a, a, a beneficial goal because then that's what stays. People, um, people remember what, how they felt with that. And then that stays when they hear a piece or they um, can connect to the experience of being at a concert because it can be quite um, electric. And mm. um, yeah, like the, the same thing, a, a student who might be playing uh, hot cross buns, but they're super excited. They're getting it right. Um, and it's great. It's infectious. Like it doesn't matter oh, yeah. what level it is because there's this honest, um, honest engagement to what they're playing. Mm. And um yeah, if if we could kind of help that along, then I, I think that'd be a, a good addition. Nice one. Um, now, speaking of uh, teaching and studying, uh, I understand uh, you've uh, done a, a thing where you've enrolled in a PhD degree. Um, now, I, from my own experience, I know it's sort of um, it's, it's always a good idea at the time, and then you, know, you sort of get into the middle of it, and then you kind of second guess yourself. But um, uh, yeah, so you're currently, uh, so you're knee doctor, Carlin, at this stage, and um, you're currently completing your PhD. Could you tell us a little bit about what your research topic is on? Sure. So, yeah, um, still early days, just over a year in, and um, the I spent quite a lot of time thinking, I mean, ironing about what I wanted to do, how I was going to do it. So the only way I could see myself doing this would be to tie in things I wanted to do anyway. So my, musically, um, so in terms of playing and writing, I want to, oh, I, I really enjoy writing music for non-jazz musicians and jazz musicians, or sorry, improvising musicians, um, okay. just um, improvising musicians and non-improvising musicians, normally in the classical world. Um, so that's that's what's, what's, what I'm enjoying exploring. So my, PhD will be um, unpacking the connections between improvisation and composition, and um, why, if if I'm being so detailed about writing a composition for that many classical musicians, why leave variables for improvisation? What what are you going to gain if you, that might be better or worse? Uh, why open it up to that variable when you can actually just be quite prescriptive? So um, lots of challenges there um, and also taking yourself out of the picture but vaguely speaking improvisation and composition and how they kind of overlap um, and motivations for that cool all right um, well obviously early days so I'm, I'm guessing you probably haven't got to any conclusions or definitive no, conclusions at this stage yeah I'll let you know yeah all right but um, yeah we'll keep an eye out for it once it's uh, all done and dusted so, yeah good luck with that um, yeah, you'll need a lot of Red Bull let me tell you um, <laughs> All right, now uh, we're coming to the tail end of the interview. And again, thanks so much for your time, Raf. I know it's uh, uh, at, in the current stage, it's always a bit tedious to you know stay any any minute longer on online <laughs> platforms. I know it can be quite taxing, but um, just, yeah, a, f a couple of final questions to finish up. And it's quite topical at the moment because um, uh, at the time of this recording, uh, we've just gone back into the second lockdown 2.0 here in Sydney, and we're up to our uh, third week fourth week third week uh, yeah yeah i literally yeah. lost count yeah yeah but um you know we're back to online learning like it, it's yeah back to square one basically and um a, a question uh, first question i have for you uh is that you know covid19 has affected all musicians across the planet in some shape or form and um it's not just you know performances it's the teaching side of things of course and just you know our very essence of what we do has sort of been you know it's been upturned uprooted and changed drastically uh for you uh, i mean how has it sort of impacted on your um uh, playing and composition side of things and you know have you found some ways to sort of work around uh the current situation ah uh, um yeah so no it is very topical so I'd just today, um, well, some big projects that have been in the pipeline. So this project with Camerata and the Australian Voices is a it's two and a half, two and a half years, or a bit over two years actually, 
to try to get this off the ground. Um, so it was all meant to happen last year, mm -hmm. um, which it didn't, and then pushed it back to later in the year, it didn't happen. They pushed it back to the beginning of this year, and then that didn't happen. There was a COVID scare, so I couldn't actually be there for the creative development. And then, yeah, so these, it, it's really hard. Um, it's And then when they're big, big machines with lots of different people and venues involved, it's so, yeah, it's clunky. Um, and, and I was, so that's one. And the other one is I meant to tour an album, which should have been toured last year and released. I recorded in 2018. So oh, it's, wow. it's, I know, I know. Mm. Uh, it's just taken, other stuff's come up and I've been trying to do other things. And now I was meant to do that last year, which is still late. Um, and, but that's going to be released <laughs> this year. <laughs> um, it was meant to be, yeah, that's, that's been pushed so many times. I mean, was, you lock in a bunch of things and then you, go back to the drawing board, book them in again. And so it takes a lot of energy. I guess that's one reason why I'm really excited about th that new trio because it's three people mm -hmm. and it's very easy. Everyone's in the same state. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's COVID is hard. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm still able to engage in some you know, music is can be writing, can be playing, can be teaching, like it's all something um, within the music realm, which is I'm grateful for because there are other people who aren't able to, you know, they're just, I have colleagues who are just performers and mm. that's tough. Um, yeah. if, if that's gone completely, then yeah. So I guess from the early on, uh, probably the same for you, like being a sex player, you realized you had to spread your net pretty wide to um, cover all bases. Um, to because you know you, yeah just it's like an insurance policy yeah um, yeah so that that's helpful um and it's, yeah and then it comes to places like that times like this and you go back to the drawing board again yeah it's certainly um yeah it's not it's not fun let's put it that way but um i guess you know you gotta try and yeah there's not much you can do try and make the most of what you can i guess hmm. um now I've got a bit of a, a deep question for you, and it, it's hard to be, maybe answer this one at this stage because uh, you know it's still very early days in um, the pandemic, I guess, um, and you know it's very hard to see what the long term effects going to be. But what changes do you think um, might, as a result of COVID nineteen, what sort of changes do you sort of foresee happening within um, the Sydney music scene, or maybe even the Australian music scene? Like, what do you kind of envisage might sort of with all this online stuff and you know shutting down closing up people being uh, restricted to venues and things like what what do you sort of think might sort of come out of all this um and maybe change um i guess there's two two parts one is these other avenues have been um activated more so than previously so there are live gigs or live streaming um and I haven't engaged with them enough to know how successful they are, but I, I think that it's helpful for two reasons. One, it, something's happening and people can engage with it. You know, instead of Netflix, they can watch a gig. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that's great. And I also think that they're gonna, I like, I like to think that people will engage with live performance more because the digital performance is not a substitute. Mm. Um, hopefully it's just a compliment um, so I think that is my um, kind of, I hope that it, it, we haven't kind of been supplanted um, by a virtual um, replacement. Um, so, a big pun? Oh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that with live streams, you know, most people will be um, watching uh, live musicians performing as opposed to, say, a DJ just sitting there going... Yeah, like that was, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I think so. And the I guess there's um, scope to, uh, so I was meant to do a, a, a live video recording next week, um, but it just got, got a little bit too, um, too tricky with where everything's at right now. But I was looking forward to that because it is a, hopefully it'll happen soon, but it, it's nice to have, you can do it a different thing with it. It's like an album it doesn't have to be a live recording. It can be an album where you do it in a different way. So the video can be more, it can, exp it can showcase and express a different identity to just one camera 
and gig. You know, you can mm. capture the space, you can capture the musicians in a way that the live performance might not. Um, uh, I guess I'm just trying to think about how to utilize it. I need to get better at that that side of things because yeah, it's um it's a whole world and kind of if you don't have any you know, video content and digital assets like that, then you don't really exist. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um yeah, brutal but true. Yeah, it's sort of having that presence that really mm. helps with that side of things. Um, cool. All right, well, maybe something a bit more lighthearted to wrap up. <laughs> Um, and this is a question I ask all the guests, but um, uh, if you had 10 minutes to practice and like, say it's like in between students or, you know, you've got like mm -hmm. just literally a 10 minute window, what would you practice and why? Sure. Um, I think I'd do two things. Um, one, I really, I really enjoy my initial long tones um, just because they... You know, getting taking a deep breath and playing using all my air then taking another deep breath and playing for as long as i feel comfortable just i feel like my lungs and my whole body expands and i i just feel like i'm in where i wherever i am in my day in my head that just brings me down to a space where i can play better sound better and engage with my instrument um because my brain just goes <laughs> um yeah, and, my, all... and my sound goes much better as well. Um, yeah, it's almost meditative. So totally, absolutely. So there's th that will be the first few minutes. Um, then, I I would like to. Oh, hello. Oh. Hey, Tim. Hey, Tim. Um, then I would like to um, probably be creative. Um, I think it'll be nice. I think that'll be a healthy thing just to have a few minutes of generating great sound engaging with the instrument and then actually engaging with music so um improvising in some way and trying to respond to that i think that'd be a nice ten, use of 10 minutes a day yeah i think so and quite meditative too good way mm. to sort of clear your head and get things happening um tim thanks for joining us um unfortunately that was the last question <laughs> but if you have any questions for raf um feel free to yell out that's so good. I just couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't join you before now, unfortunately. Oh, that's all right. Um, but yeah, you got any questions for Raf while he's here? I mean, yeah. I'm terrified that I'll repeat a question that uh, that has already been asked. But um, nah, go or, for or it. Something we'll... we already talked about. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a better answer this time. Go for it. <laughs> oh, legend. All right. Um, okay. So if I had to pick something, I would pick uh, what is the what is the biggest sort of thing that you feel that you've achieved musically out of the Peggy Glanville Hicks residency um, with, with a little bit of distance from it now. Oh, that's a good one, Tim. That's a good one. This one. Yeah. Uh, um, the biggest thing I got out of it. Uh, so I wanted to spend the year figuring out what um, music meant, oh, there you are, uh, figuring out what, um, how to find myself in all these different projects. So, the, so I, I can't remember how many concerts I put on. Um, there was, there's a music space there. Um, so maybe six concerts. Um, and for each concert, I wrote something else for a different ensemble. So, um, I guess the th things personally I got out of it was I felt like, uh, I felt terrified being in the space of all the people who'd lived there. That was pretty intimidating. Um, but I also felt um, inspired and encouraged to step up. So the, the biggest thing for me was, okay, I'm in this space. How can I deliver? I mean, I'm in this, in this room and everyone else is composed in this space. How can I bring myself to it? Um, yeah, and then I I tried pretty hard to to maximize everything I could. It was very strategic about everything I wanted to write and how I was going to make it happen and what I wanted to explore. Um, so yeah, the things I do differently, but that's that's kind of the that was the starting point and the objective. That's very cool. Nice one, thanks, Tim. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Clarkson, hopefully a future guest at some stage. Yeah. Um, I'll, oh, that would be amazing. I'll definitely hit you up at some stage. I do have a list that I'm working through, but it's it's massive. So I'll, we'll get to you. I promise, Tim. Don't worry. There's, um, there's a lot of good sax players in town. So, I you know, know. I know. Terrifying. There's so many. Um, anyway, um, Raf, 
thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, it was really great to sort of uh, to pick your brains and um, you know get to know you a bit more. And um, like I know you've only been in Sydney for a few years since 2018, but um, hopefully you know a lot more people are becoming more aware that you're in town and yeah, you know, what an amazing musician you are. And you know, so lucky to have you in our, our very own backyard. Um, are there any particular things? I, I know sort of throughout the interview you mentioned a few things that you're working on, but um, just in terms of things for people to keep an eye out for and how to keep abreast of what's coming up with RAF, what's the best way to do this? Sure. Uh, so first of all, thanks for having me on the show. And it was, it was nice to, um, yeah, thanks for letting me talk about myself for an hour and a half. Uh, uh, no um, the, the, um, the main things I have coming up, uh, which I'd love for people to connect with, will, um, on the 1st of September, the... Um, Camerata and the Australian Voices, uh, and I will perform a new 60-minute work for Voices and Strings and Saxophone. Um, that will be at the Judith Wright Centre in Brisbane, but it should also be live streamed um, cool. in some platform mm -hmm. to be TBC. Um, and then there'll be a national album launch with a, a quintet, um, uh, some new All My Stuff, which will be fun. Mm -hmm. That'll be with Nadia Nordhaus, Matt McMahon, Brett Hurst, and um, Simon Barco, James Waples. So I'm really excited about that. Seriously. And then, uh, yeah, and then the new trio with um, Steve Barry and Hannah James. They're, they're the three, hopefully I'm not forgetting anything. They're the three main things on my mind right cool, now. Cool. So you have a website. So if people ah, can sort yes, of please. just check that out and just uh, mailing list and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so there's a little um, subscribe button I, I send out. I don't spam very often. Every, you know, and there's something worth spamming i will yeah. let you know but every couple of months i might send a little update a newsletter of all the activities so yeah please check out my website and um there's a news blog section as well i took it off the front so you know you have to go so it's a little bit more user friendly cool cool all right well yeah thanks again raf and tim thanks for joining us as well um great to have some company um until next time folks uh thank you very much uh for tuning in uh, for all our friends in New South Wales and Victoria, I uh, hope you guys are staying safe and uh, you know, keeping, trying to keep well in this crazy time. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, there is, uh, there will be light at the end of the tunnel, I'm sure, at some stage. We just got to, yeah, just ride it out. Until then, though, um, I'm hoping to have some more of these. So stay tuned and have a good evening.